Welcome to WorkSpan TV. I'm Allison Avalos, Research Manager for World at Work. In today's research and brief, we'll be discussing the recently released Flexibility Programs and Practices Survey, which includes information about the prevalence of flexibility programs, how those programs are managed, and the relationship of flexibility to a variety of success factors. I'm joined today by Rose Stanley, Work Life Practice Leader for World at Work. Welcome, Rose. Thanks, Allison. Good to be here. Well, as you know, World at Work has published the Telework Trendlines Report for a number of years, which looks at data gathered from employees in the workforce. And this is the first time where we actually have a survey that looks at all different types of flexibility in one survey, and it's gathered from employees, so we get to hear their perspective on the programs. So in the end, what did we learn about the most common programs out there in use today? Well, Allison, we asked the question um, in terms of like 13 different types of flexibility programs. And every single organization answered those questions, and we found that most, all of those 13 were utilized somewhere within our organizations today. The top three that we found were part-time and flex time, which actually has been around for quite a long time, and ad hoc teleworking, which was a little bit interesting to find that. Um, and ad hoc teleworking was defined as uh, being able to telework to perhaps meet a repairman. So those were the top three that we saw across the board. And there were on average about six programs that most employers seemed to offer at one time. And was there any difference from sector to sector or industry to industry in terms of the programs that are being offered? We did take a look at the different industry sectors. And in the finance and in the consulting services sector, we did find that there was a high prevalence of programs in many areas, especially in those top three. The other area that we did look at was in the hospital area in the industry, and we found that really those organizations seemed to try to utilize as many different programs as possible. In the manufacturing side, we saw that there was still a very high prevalence within the top three, and, and again, in that ad hoc teleworking, they had a pretty high percentage as well, so that was an interesting find. You know, in addition to the data on prevalence of program, I understand there's information about training, employees and managers, how do you communicate, um, how do you administer these programs, as well as information about the perceived effect on employee satisfaction, motivation, and engagement. What is your big takeaway in terms of the state of flexibility today and what contributes to overall success? One of the things that I think that you will find in the survey is that it doesn't necessarily always rely just simply on having the programs in place, but actually having them as a part of the culture of the organization. And the survey really kind of points out to that fact that the more culturally embedded you have flexibility as a part of your culture, the more that you're going to see in perhaps lower turnover and higher satisfaction and engagement of employees. So it sounds like the survey is telling us that it is more about embracing a culture of flexibility than it being having you know six programs in place or offering a specific type of program that's going to guarantee your success. It's really something you have to live every day. Yes, Allison. As a matter of fact, we have seen, and uh, what one thing I really like about the study is we went out and asked for organizations to slot themselves in, in a continuum of how much they felt that they were flexible in their flexibility. And the higher that they went up, we saw some of the findings that I just stated. So what we're concluding is that it's not the number of programs. It's how you utilize those programs and how you embrace those programs and how much it just becomes another way of doing business. It's just a part of a culture. And the more that it can become embedded in the culture, the more that you see the success of those programs. What about the bottom line? Is there any evidence that there's impact there? We have seen in like the Fortune 100 Best, where Great Places to Work, who conducts the survey, has done a um, study over the last 10 years or so that consistently shows the people that end up on the Fortune 100 list, their shareholder value far exceeds the S&P. They've done like a 10-year study on this, and part of their survey includes work life. It, it it's, encompasses a lot more things, 
in terms of employee satisfaction and things like that. But it does include that employee value proposition, which includes the work-life area. And we do see that consistency in a, uh, a higher return for the shareholders. So not only is it good for the employees, it's good for the business as well. I'd like to thank you, Rose, for joining us today and sharing some of the survey findings as well as your insights. If you'd like more information about this survey or the full report, please visit the World at Work website. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Research and Brief. For WorkSpan TV, I'm Allison Avalos.